Island today. We are down by the water. This is Lake Erie behind me. And this is my daughter. She's with me painting today. <laughs> so we decided we would take advantage of the sunshine in this warm weather. And so I just finished this painting and I will show you how I did it. All right, well once I've found a spot where I want to paint, uh, I have everything in my backpack. And I always say, if you can't carry it, you don't need it. So I have everything here and it's really not that heavy. Um, so I have found my spot and this backpack is specifically designed for plein air painting. It has all kinds of pockets and mesh pockets and it expands to be pretty nice and spacious. The tripod, just a standard tripod. This is an open end design easel. This is the Pochard box. You just open it up like this and on the back is this little device that fits into the tripod. There's usually a crank to lift this up and down. I have these little brass screws here and I slide it into the appointed slots. Tighten them up. So this is my little bucket and I hang it right here on this little screw that's hanging out. I'm all set. Now I'm going to take, I, I have these little containers that clip onto regular handheld pallets. You can get the kinds with the screw top lid. Those will work just as well too. But I have a separate little container in here for my linseed oil. And that's the only medium I use. So I clip it right over here to my pallet extension. Now this is set up and ready to paint. I do just a few more things before I'm ready to go. Okay, so I also will take, um, because I'm using paper towels, you always gotta bring a garbage bag. And if it's not too windy, I'll put it down here in my tripod legs. If it's windy, then I'll just keep this in my backpack and throw the paper towels in here. I don't like it flapping in the wind. It's just my own personal preference, but um, I open up these tripod legs here. And another one over here along a medium length bungee cord and I string my paper towels through it and I hang those up right there on my tripod. So that's all set and it's ready to go. Now for brushes, I carry them in this little tube and inside I just have my brushes. So I have my 8x10 Raymar wet panel carrier and inside today I just have a 6x8 and this is a masonite panel with just a couple coats of gesso, acrylic gesso sand in between coats. All right, so this is where I'm gonna put this and I'll show you how I do that. On the back of this open M are some little wing nuts here and they are spring loaded. So I'm going to loosen them up. The brackets in front can move. So I'm gonna turn this around. Put the panel up, move these brackets together and I'll just start by tightening one side. So that, that guy isn't going to move anyway. So now I'll squeeze this one in, nice and tight. And I'll tighten this one up. And now my panel is secured and in place, and I'm ready to start. When I put the paints on the panel, I always keep them in the same order, because it's like a musician and their keyboard. They always know where the keys are. And so once I get going and I'm working kind of quickly, I like to know that my colors are always in the same place. And I allow myself as much mixing space as possible. I know that this, this design is only an 8x10, which doesn't leave me a lot of mixing space, but I like it because this whole thing here, not cutting the tripod, weighs a pound and a quarter, and I love that. Titanium white, cadmium yellow pale, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, and phthalo green. When I get to a place and I get everything set up, I like to begin my plein air painting with a thumbnail sketch. And so I'll just do a quick sketch in my little book. I don't spend more than a couple minutes just laying down the, the key places where I want everything to go, dividing the sky and the horizon about two thirds. And then I kind of put some key central uh, characters off to the side, about one third in. Just as a quick formula, it's, I don't always do that, but sometimes when I'm just working quickly and I'm looking at a scene, trying to compose it as I look ahead and 
just really try to simplify it. I wanted to get a little bit of uh, Cleveland back in there and um, wanted to figure out how that would all come into play. And I'm also working out a little bit of the value digression. So that Cleveland section way back there was a lot lighter and then of course as we move closer the values get stronger and darker. So I begin with a little bit of ultramarine blue and burnt sienna thinned down. And using a size 2 bristle brush, I then replicate what I had for a thumbnail sketch. I'm not as worried about the scene as I am about just making sure that I secure exactly what it was that I thought about in my thumbnail sketch. So there's my two-thirds division. And I'm thinking about where the shoreline comes around and wraps and does its little zigzagging. And I'm working to keep my brush brushwork very loose and just soft and suggested. That way I can move things around as I need to. And I didn't want that horizontal line coming straight down, excuse me, the diagonal line coming straight down to the corner. So I wanted to just sort of alter it a little bit above the corner. You can go above or below, but just not directly in the corner. Always trying to make every aspect of your picture and your scene as interesting as possible. You're always telling a story, no matter what you're painting, even if it's something just as simple as a couple of apples on a table or a simple plein air study. And this, this whole entire uh, process here, I really don't spend more than about 20 minutes on this outside. And I edited this video down, taking out some of the mixing yeah, just to help um, streamline it. But none of this is sped up. And the point of this video in particular was just to highlight that um, you don't need to make plein air paintings last a long, long time. You can get out and in 15 minutes work really hard and fast just to capture the key color notes of an area. It's not about creating a finished painting, but it's about capturing the light and some of those colors that are in the sun that are you just don't get when you take a picture. At the end of this video, I show a photograph of the scene and you'll see just from the picture there's no way you would have captured all these colors and the sunlight just from that photo. So now I'm mixing up a little bit of ultramarine blue and white, titanium white, starting at the top with that color. It's You can almost see even behind the canvas there, it's pretty close <laughs> to the sky color. So I'm just working at the top. I'm not going with the darkest part of the blue sky directly above because we just simply don't see that much. And then as the sky moves down towards the horizon, it gets, of course, lighter, but it also gets a little warmer. And instead of adding yellow, which would make it green, <laughs> I had green to make it warmer, <laughs> if that makes any sense. So a little bit of phthalo green added to that white and blue mixture, added more white and a little bit of phthalo, and it works. You can see there in the picture, it just has sort of that yellowy tone, and uh, the blue above it is a little more rosy violet tone. And boy, that box is wiggling a lot. I should have tightened it. I didn't even notice when I was painting it. Um, so again, now I am grabbing just a teeny bit of yellow as you get much closer down to the horizon, but you can see I'm, I'm very um, liberal with the amount of white that I use when I'm laying down a sky using small little strokes, just um, pieces of color. I did love how beautiful and smooth the sky was on this day. So I did come back through here. You'll see it in a little bit. Uh, just with a little bit bigger brush and without making the effort to try to blend and smooth it all in, I just gently do a little bit of just sort of cross hatching to take out some of the jarring, uh, distracting lumps and bumps. And so I like that effect with the cooler at the top. And so this is just little X's and I'm keeping that bigger dry brush in the blue first and then gently bringing it down into the warmer areas. That's about all that treatment gets there. So now I'm working on a little bit more violet tone for the horizon. And then um, I just took a lizard crimson and ultramarine blue and a little bit of white. And I'll use that directly across, adding a little bit more alizarin and ultramarine blue to make a little bit more darker purple as that piece of horizon gets closer to us. A little bit of burnt sienna to warm it up. 
makes it look a little bit more earthy dirt color. I'll leave that distant patch over there, that shade of purple that it is, but as it comes closer to us, I want more of that earth tone color. Still using that size 2 brush because I'm focusing on the far away distant features. And there's Cleveland right there. <laughs> and you can really just suggest distant cities, just a few subtle little bumps and strokes as long as they don't look like trees and they have that um, straight vertical unnatural feature then the, it'll feel like a city and I'm adding just a little bit of highlights on those buildings so that it looks like uh, the lights hitting it and some sand accents over there to show the shoreline hitting the the plane of the sky While I was down by the water, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I brought my daughter. And so we were both out there painting and the wind was coming off the lake. Uh, it was very cold. <laughs> Up at the top where we parked the car, we had to walk down a flight of stairs. It was warm, it was about 64 degrees up where we parked our car and then we walked down the stairs and all of a sudden it was freezing cold <laughs> and blowing. So that's another one of the reasons that this video ended up being, being very short. But I still thought there's some valuable lessons in here and some just some nice paint handling. So I thought I would go ahead and edit it and get it out to you. So that's Thalo Green. And um, I'm just adding it to the white mixture that I had. They're a little bit more blue. I am going to be focusing now on getting some of that water in. And what I do is when I'm mixing, I'll mix up a color and test it. And if it needs to be lighter or darker or warmer or cooler or whatever, um, I'll make adjustments, but just that putting that one little on there and then looking is, is all you really need to do. Just put it down, look at it, and make that assessment. I had forgotten my tube of phthalo green at home, <laughs> and so fr very frustratingly, um, I had to use what I had left on the palette. It was almost dried out, so. but. I think I managed to do okay, and I was able to squeeze out a little bit from the pile. And that's really all I needed. It's a very powerful color. You don't really need very much. So grabbing a little bit more of that and some white into that mixture as the water moved over towards the, um, towards the shore. It was picking up a little bit more of the sky. So grabbing some yellow ochre and some ultramarine blue, mixing those right into that blue-green mixture for the water. As the water came closer to us, it was a little more warmer, a little more yellow ochre in it. And I'm keeping my brushwork very loose and very quick, um, also horizontal. If it wasn't extremely cold and windy, I probably would have gone a bit slower. But given the, the nature of everything, I just I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to get it done. <laughs> this will be a lesson in just getting the color notes. Again, this is not sped up. I was really working that fast. <laughs> Burr. Um, and so that is right there. As the water comes into the sand, I made it a little bit more violet with that alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue right into that mixture. And then as it goes back, I added a little more ochre and... Let it uh, let it go back into the the water, and of course it was going to be picking up more of the sky reflection on the surface of the water as it moved into the deeper areas. A little bit there is that beautiful yellow green color that you really can't see from this video or from the final photo when I show you the the scene. But when I was standing on this big rock and I was painting this scene, I was kind of looking down on the water and you could see this gorgeous green, which I just did by adding a little bit more of the cad yellow pale into that blue-green mixture. And that got that pretty water color. And now I'm sort of blending in these passages of these different colors as I saw them. And I did, I had switched to a size four. Nope, that's a size six bristle brush, flat. I like flats. I can um, flatten them to a chiseled edge 
And I, I, I just, there are times, more times that I find that I need a chiseled edge than, say, a filbert or a round. Now I'm adding a little bit of movement on the surface of the water by just taking a little bit lighter sage green and just sort of scumbling it over the top. And here I took some yellow ochre and a little bit of white just to get that passage. You can kind of see it in the background here too. As the water comes and crests, it has that ochre color and I was uh, hoping to try to catch some of that color in there. Now um, for the sand, since I had the yellow ochre on my brush, I mixed a little bit of white and burnt sienna into it. And that is, um, that's that color that I'm working on there. Again, just laying it down in quick, broad um, stretches. When I squinted down at the scene, I could just see this general sand color as I saw it. And I do add variations to it a little bit later, but I wanted to just capture that quick sunlit color of sand and lay that down quickly as I saw it. Using the brush strokes to show the shape of the land, I just do sweeping horizontal strokes. And then as the sand met the water there, I just soften the edge of the water where it meets the sand a little bit by just using the brush as it was. Every, and I keep the paper towel, a paper towel in my other hand, and I'm constantly wiping my brush off. People ask all the time, how to keep your colors clean? How do you keep them from getting muddy? Well, I'm always cleaning my brush. Right? You'll see I, I will often use one or two brushes for an entire painting um, because I'm always cleaning it. Whether I clean it out in the can of turpentine or the Gamsol or Odalis Mineral Spirits or um, just wiping it off on a rag, depending on what I'm going to mix up next. So these are cast shadows from a, f a stand of trees that were blocking the sun from the beach. It was um, to our backs a little bit, backs into the side. And so all these shadows were being cast across the beach, with a, which I thought was kind of interesting. So I wanted to paint them there without being too stripey and distracting. And then um, to get these darker colors for the next little while here, I'm, I just mixed up an ultramarine blue and burnt sienna dark mixture, about equal parts. The more blue you add, the darker it gets. And so I'm creating some of the solid darker notes. Just the, what I have here in the painting is that it's mostly all middle tone with the exception of some of the lighter passages in the water and the sand. So now I thought that it would be a really great time to add some of these darker accents and um, get those trees in and start seeing some of it come together. And to do tree, I, I just gently drag the brush down, not pressing very hard. And correcting the shape of this little hut that was here on the beach and the cast shadow from it. And there were all these piles of rocks and, and things that sort of jutted out into the water and that's what these elements here are which I thought that they created a nice dynamic and rhythm in the course of the painting drawing the eye back over towards Cleveland and um, just sort of up the shore which is one of the things that I when I saw the scene I thought oh, I really like how those things just sort of lead the eye in the rocks and so forth and so Keeping my brush very uh, just flat, simple, horizontal little strokes. That's all those are. I'll come back through and add some highlights on the tops of the rocks, and that's it. Nothing else needs to be done for those. Breaking up that part of the shoreline, uh, some more rocks. And there's the highlight color. And that is just uh, white with yellow ochre, a little bit of cad yellow. There might have been some burnt sienna still somewhere in my brush, but that's okay. It just kind of, it basically was that sand color, with a little bit more white. Because those did, weren't catching any of the shadows from the trees, so they were just right out there in the spotlight. 
And sometimes your little marks don't really have to make sense, but they can just add a visual texture and interest to an area. So working on um, some of the wet sand as it comes around and the water was darkening the sand, I just had made a nice violet color with ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson. There you can see it a little better. I love, I love that, those, those big brush strokes and that juicy paint. Just letting it sit and just be, letting it exist on the canvas as is. That's fun. Grabbing some white. I'll take a little bit of that and mix it in with some of the other colors. Just a little though, because I just wanted to put in a few little parts where the wave was cresting and turning over. You can see from the background they were <laughs> real big waves today. <laughs> no, just little tiny lake waves. But, uh, you know, it's beautiful. It was a beautiful day, except for the cold. You wouldn't know from this uh, video that it was very windy, too. Alright, so cleaning up some of that up there where I had those darker passages. And now I'm just going to add a little bit more finesse on these trees, letting some of that darker color mix with the sky color to create the illusion of little tiny twigs and branches that are being diffused by light. So I'm doing those first, and then I'll put a few more um, stronger branches over the tops of those. So it sort of creates that look of, you know, tree foliage, like that. There's some of those stronger arms on that tree. And given the distance that this tree is from the viewer, it was important that I select the amount or lack of detail in the tree because I didn't want it to be distracting or look artificial and drawn. A little window for the house so the guy there can look out. And look at Cleveland. Probably has a great view at night. You know, and just cleaning up some of these shadows and just giving this whole passage along the beach a little bit more finesse and leading the eye in that way. Now we got to put a few people in the scene. And you don't need to get fussy with those. It's just a little bit of a little vertical dark mark. I try to make, shape them like carrots if possible, but I did not have a brush smaller than that size too, so I figured, you know, this will suffice little tiny dashes and makes it look like there's people doing stuff, walking dogs, whatever. Gives the scene a little bit of life. I like that aspect. Alright, that wraps it up. Thank you so much for joining me on this short little video. Have a wonderful day.